Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, the, and thank you for inviting me. I'm just here to welcome everybody to this really wonderful event this afternoon. And so, uh, and I wanna thank our alumni for being here to share their experiences about the Benedictine values, what they mean to you today, what they meant to you as you were students here at St. Scholastica, and I'm excited to hear what you have to share with us today. So welcome to you all. It's been a very wonderful week, uh, starting with the Mass on Sunday, recognizing the Feast of St. Scholastica and the inauguration event. Uh, I want to thank everybody who participated in that event earlier this week on Monday. We had a fabulous day, and we continue to celebrate the Feast of St. Scholastica, our patron, throughout the entire week. So a big shout out to Sister Kathleen Del Monte for all the work she's put into this effort as well. So enjoy the presentation and the panel, and here we go. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. You can set it in the mic. Thank you. As President McDonald mentioned, this is a panel of alums. My name is John Bauman. I work in the School of Education. I'm also a Dignitas instructor. It's my job to moderate the panel. The great part about this experience, if you're willing to partake, is that it isn't just about us. We would like you involved in this conversation. So if you would, please, there are two walking microphones. Would those folks hold up the microphones and just be present in the space? We have one up here and one up there. If you'd like to speak, just stand or raise your hand and hopefully they'll see you and come to you. We also have two wired mics down here. You are more than welcome to come up and ask a question or join the conversation. We'd really like it to go where you are interested in going with it. The whole idea of today's panel is to address or discuss the Benedictine values, their impact on our lives as we move through college and into a new word called adulting, sometimes a noun, sometimes a verb. Uh, I had a great time getting to know all three of our panelists while we were having lunch today. I haven't had that much fun in about three days, so it was great. They're lively people. They're quick in, with their wit. They're quick with their thought and they're thoughtful about what they say, which I greatly appreciate. So a couple of ground rules. Please put your devices away unless you're doing one of two things. Taking notes with it or using it as an assistive technology. We show respect by doing so and someday you'll be in a position where you are in charge of a large group and you'll want that same respect. So let's, let's build it today. Thank you. Our panelists, thank you for coming today. I appreciate it, and I had fun getting to know you over lunch. First, Felicia Cham in the middle. I'll read the biography that she gave me to read. I'll do it with all three. Felicia is a first-generation Cambodian-American student from Prior Lake, Minnesota. She graduated in the spring of 2018 with a Bachelor of Arts in Management with a concentration in healthcare. While Felicia attended Scholastica, she was the multi, Multicultural Leadership Orientation Coordinator, Lead Center for Justice Living Coordinator, a Teaching Assistant for Dignitas, President of the Asian Student Union, Marketing Chair of the International Club, and a member of the women's rugby team. After graduation, she moved back home to Prior Lake and then was accepted into the Scholastica's MBA Leadership and Change program at the St. Paul campus. Felicia just graduated in the fall of 2019 with her MBA. Currently, she has a role as a Human Resources Director at Monarch Healthcare Management for North Shore Estates and Superior Rehab right here in the Duluth Superior area. Welcome her, please. Thank you. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Samaj Moore, off on the right. 24 years old, lives in Minneapolis as a young professional in the local music industry. Is that ambiguous <laughs> enough for you? That's pretty ambiguous. You're going to have to tell us a little bit more after a while. Since leaving St. Scholastica, he's moved back to his hometown and started his own business and also works at First Avenue. It's a slight change from his English degree. Yes, he graduated with an English degree. But his communication skills and ability to write are greatly utilized. 
He's excited to join us today for our feast day celebration. Welcome, Samaj, please. <laughs> Samaj, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Michael Jackson, to my right. And yes, that's his real name. And no, he doesn't moonwalk. <laughs> Awkward pause. It's okay, Michael wrote that line for me. So. <laughs> He's a 2016 graduate of the College of St. Scholastica with the Bachelor's of Science in Computer Information Systems and Computer Science and Psychology. While at St. Scholastica, he was a member of the Summer Team Delta for four years, coming back after graduation for yet another dose of Megan Perry Spear, and a welcome week Delta for three years running. He served on the Student Senate and was a Dignitas mentor, teaching assistant, in a course on resilience. After graduation, Michael received a certificate in cybersecurity and a certificate in front-end web development. Last year, he started working here at CSS as a web developer and is currently pursuing a master's of science in applied data analytics. In his free time, what there is of it, <laughs> Michael is the co-founder of an organization in future 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to empowering teens and young adults with chronic illness called the Greater Than Three. He enjoys keeping up on the latest technological trends, comedy, hanging out with friends and family, pressing the yes, I'm still watching button on Netflix that we're all familiar <laughs> with, while ignoring his friends and family and writing biographies about himself in the third person. Welcome, Michael. Please welcome Michael. So a note to those in the audience, again, you're invited to join in at any point, as long as you don't cut one of us off, that'd be great. Basic communication skills, right? But we also have some guests on Zoom if anybody's come in, and people on Zoom, you're more than welcome to ask a question. We have someone monitoring the chat, and that person will speak your voice here today. Thank you. Are you ready? Let me do a little intro, and then I'll ask you the first question. Right? <laughs> oh, okay. Our mission at the College of St. Scholastica states, shaped by the Catholic Benedictine heritage, our, the College of St. Scholastica provides intellectual and moral preparation for responsible living and meaningful work. There are four major words in there. Intellectual and moral preparation for responsible living and meaningful work. I've attended three different institutions of higher education. At none of the three were values discussed. You're lucky to be here. We're blessed to have this part of our curriculum. To be able to enter into, and that word adulting again, having some basis of right and wrong, and challenging our belief and our experiences is vital in the world. So let's see what, how these folks transition. Would you please tell us a little bit about your college story, how you entered, how you attended, how you graduated, and then what it was like entering into adulting? Who would like to go first? I guess I'll go first. Samaj, you your first. Is the mic on? Oh, yes. Okay, cool. Um, so, the, my senior year of high school was really um, not fun. Uh, um, I, was, I was really struggling with my classes, and um, I went to De La Salle High School in Minneapolis, and it was just, um, towards the end, it just got really rough there. My home life was a little bit rough, so I was already turned off by the idea of college, but my... Um, family was very adamant that I would go because no one in my family had graduated before. It was like, you know, you're going to college whether you like it or not. So I had this, um, this weird addiction to go to the University of Minnesota for some reason. Like, I was just like, I'm just going to go to the U of M and I'm going to be a CEO one day. I'm going to, like, run the world. So that's going to be the end of that. And then um, U of M turned me down. And then I was like, okay, I'll go to UMD. And then they turned me down. So uh, St. So uh, Scholastica was my last choice, and I feel bad saying that. Um, but uh, they accepted me into this program called, uh, I don't know if they still have it, I don't think they do, um, FYDP, First Year Development Program. Mm -hmm. 
um, amazing cohort, cohort of um, professors and people. Um, Steve Bacchus was one of my mentors, and then I started working for him. Um, so it was, it was challenging started, starting, and then they said, you know, get a certain GPA, get a certain, you know, thing going, and you get to stay. So I rocked my first year. And um, what was the other question? Like, how did, like, the... What was it like? So you came in as a business management major, right? Yeah, that was my first. So I, I kept that idea. So I was a, um, wanted to start off being a management major because I wanted to be a CEO or something. And then, like, my first semester, I just didn't like it. It was weird. It felt like I was controlling people. It, like, taught me how to, like, this is how you get people to do what you want. And, and I was like, I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's me. I don't know if I want to do that. And I, and I always loved English. My, my, my first dream was to grow up and be, like, this famous author like J.K. Rowling and, like, make a billion dollars. And um, uh, so I, I switched over from management to English. And then after that, I just loved it. Like, I couldn't. I just couldn't do anything else. I loved doing papers. All my friends hated doing 16-page papers. Whenever a professor was like, you have a 16-page paper due, I was like, yes, like, it's going to be done by tomorrow. Like, fine. Um, so um, yeah, it, it, once, I, once I decided to stick with English, it was, I had an amazing um, presence of really supportive professors like Dr. James Crane. Um, she's not here anymore, but my favorite professor of all time was Dr. Heather Bastian. She's just a brilliant, 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 brilliant woman. Um, Dr. Stephanie Johnson, another person that I love dearly. Uh, I'm, I'm missing so many people. Tom Zellman. Uh, there's, so, there's so many group, just dope people, dope people that, that still help me out to this day. Um, and then I joined the Student Senate for a bit. I got accepted into doing McNair Scholars, did that for a summer. And, and then a year and a half, um, I was a campus tour guide. So I had a lot of jobs because I had to like um, maintain my life. And then I was also supporting my family who was living in Minneapolis, sending them money every now and again. And then I was also a tutor at the writing center because I loved writing so much and I loved helping other people um, finish their papers. I'm a big nerd of English, if you can't tell by now. Um, and then it was pretty. It, it was pretty. It was. It was pretty simple. Like once I got my group of friends, and then I got my group of support from the professors. Um, leaving, like finishing college and leaving college, felt simple. It, it, it started feeling difficult once I was graduating and trying to find what I was going to do after college because I was an English degree. And then my friends would always joke like. What are you going to do with that? You know, be a teacher, which is nothing wrong with being a teacher at all. But I, I didn't want to be a teacher, so it was challenging trying to figure out. Okay, I'm an English major with a medieval Renaissance minor. What the heck am I going to do with that? <laughs> um, and then out of nowhere, it was so. Uh, there was this um, in the spring of 2017. We and a group of students went to Saint Cloud University because they had this. Um, student job fair thing. And I was like, I need to go to this job fair because I'm going to be broke after May. Um, and um, Target was there. So I was like, oh, I'm going to work at Target. That, that, sounds, that sounds simple. I can you know, start at Target, you know, find my bearings. So I gave them my resume or whatever. And then I got like, this email a week later for this position. And I just like, applied for it. I didn't look at it, which was probably very stupid now looking back at it. But I applied for it. I was like, you know, if I get accepted to Target, that's going to be awesome. And then there was this email. It was, so, it was really weird, but essentially, long story short, I got this phone call, and we're talking about the position. We're talking about, you know, the interview. And I'm just accepting it. I'm like, yes, that sounds good. Benefits, yes. Healthcare, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Not really knowing what I was doing. And then um, once I started figuring out what was going on, because I'm thinking that I'm being hired by a Target. I'm going to be a cashier. I'm going to be, you know, doing like, you know, m m basic level duties. And then they were like, yeah, you have this big of a salary, 50, 50K a year, and you're going to be, the, you know, doing this and managing this group of people. And I was like, wait, what? I was like, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing what? So yeah, I just got, ex I, my first job out of college was being an ETL at Target for about a year. So I don't know, I've been, I feel like I've been pretty lucky going on the ride out. So how did you get from managing people at Target uh -huh. to working in the music industry? So um, when I always wanted to do music. Like, at least towards the beginning of senior year of college, I, because um, I was, I was, that fear of what to do with my English degree started. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this English degree, so I had to create my own thing before I'm just left out to rot. <laughs> And so I created this like music company thing called Miniox. Please follow me on Instagram. 
Um, and <laughs> serious. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, because I got really inspired by, because um, I my my college group, you know, the 2017 class and classes after we grew up on, grew up, we got Apple Music now. We have, you know, Spotify's around, we have Tidal, we have all these um, music streaming apps that are like popping everywhere. So I became really like attracted to the idea of like streaming and um, some of these companies do their own festivals. I'm like, this is like really cool and I love music and I'm passionate about it and there's real money involved. So I get to combine those two aspects. So I'm like, I'm gonna create my own little, you know, music thing. I wanna do my own music festivals. I wanna do my shows. I wanna do that. So I started that up and then graduating college, that's what I was going to do. I was gonna go back to Minneapolis. I was going to um, throw shows because I threw shows up here. Red Herring, which is unfortunately now closed. I threw a couple of shows out there, did a show in here. Um, so I was just really ready and gung ho about that idea. But then when Target called, and said, you know, here's this benefits, here's this salary, here's this, you know, security. I was like, okay, I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna put that down for a bit. I'm gonna go work at Target because that makes the most sense. Um, but being a man, being, being a manager at Target was, uh, man, um, challenging to say the least. It was, it was, it was hard. It was, it was hard being an ETO of guest experience. It was guest experience. So my job was basically. Whew, pertaining to every customer's need, um, I, I ran the cashier. I also every single profit went through my department, so I was in charge of like money. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I, so I kind of wish I didn't drop that management major. I was like, man, I could have probably stayed a management major, and this would have been a nice ride into this. Um, and then after a year, and then and then they hired me. Like, so I got hired like when I was graduating, but they didn't really start me up up until like fourth quarter which is like with retail, oh my Jesus, man. Like that is just like the most difficult time to do anything, especially that's my first job outside of college. I wasn't like a cashier working into like mid-management. I came in as top management, never knowing what retail was, never knowing what money was, and then bam, I'm working as a you know, top level manager at fourth quarter. It was just too much. So after a year, they sat me down respectfully, was like, do you still wanna be here? And I was like, you know, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, I don't. And then they got afraid of Amazon. Amazon was doing, buying, you know, um, stores around Target. Target started, they, they, they hit me with everything. Like, every single time Target came up with a new way of doing things, I was the first person to know. They're like, okay, Samaj, you have to teach your team how to do this brand new thing we've never done in the history of Target in two weeks. And I'm like, all right, okay, okay, yeah, all right, all right, I, I, I got it. Um, and then after I left Target, that's when I picked up my dream again. I was like, okay, okay I'm gonna do shows again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my own thing again. And then um, I, I was rigorously applying to First Avenue. I was like, I don't care what I do. You know, I, I was born and raised in Minneapolis. First Avenue is a powerful staple in the city. So I'm like, I have to work here because I wanna do this music industry and that's just the place to do it at, I'm in Minneapolis. So I was like, Facebook messaging the director of First Avenue. It was really creepy, actually. But it was just like, hey, you know, here's my resume. I emailed them. I called. And it was about, while I was at Target, by the way, too, so about a year passed, and um, I just got a random email. They were like, hey, we're in, doing interviews this week. Can you come down to downtown Minneapolis? I was like, I'll be there for sure. And then, yeah, that's pretty much all she wrote on that one. I started there, and then I've been there for about, uh, I started July of 28 teen, and I've been there ever since, so that's kind of how I made my way into that. That's good. Yeah, just, Thank you. just stock, stock, stock people, and you'll, you'll get hired for something. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Felicia, tell people. us your story. That is not what you're supposed to do. Don't as do that. A, as Don't an do HR that. standpoint, you're not supposed to do <laughs> I'm that. I'm joking. <laughs> um, so I did PSEO my senior year of college, so I came into Scholastica with a bunch of extra credits. I came in gung-ho, going to be a nursing major. And I was like, I want to be a director of nursing one day, maybe nurse manager. Like, I was going to, so my spring semester, I couldn't go straight into the nursing program. So I was like, what, what do I need to do? Let me do management. Did a, was going to be a major in nursing and have a minor in management. Did my management classes, found out that I was way better at management than nursing. Like, anatomy and phys is hard. Like, was not, not, not my thing, not my jam. So I decided to change and kind of was, I was able to marry the two, so I decided my sophomore year, I, was, I had a mental breakdown. You can ask Chris, Chris Davila, he was my boss. I had a mental breakdown in his office almost every other week. Um, and I decided to be able to marry, so I 
my degree was in management of the concentration healthcare. I was able to study abroad. I studied abroad twice, thankfully. I was able to go to Morocco my sophomore year and my junior slash senior year, because I graduated early, um, was in, we went to China, so I had to, I was able to experience both. So if you guys have the chance to study abroad, I highly recommend it if you have it in your budget. Um, did that, I graduated in 18, the, yeah, the spring of 18, and then went home, didn't have a job lined up, didn't have anything, kept applying. I think I did 100 applications, like don't be turned down, you'll get a job eventually. Just, just get it in that six month time frame if you have to get, pay off your student loans, because that's, that's when you gotta really, really get it, you gotta take any job. So I finished, but finished and graduated, but didn't have anything planned, didn't really have a job lined up, took, took a job at Health Partners as a Caroline assistant as, at the nurse triage line, so it still did somewhat of healthcare, but I was missing school, so I applied to the Leadership and Change program at Scholastica at the St. Paul campus, got accepted to that right away, so I did work and I did school full time, which is really tough, like doing masters, but if other people can do it, I could do it too did that and I graduated and recently took a new position as the HR director at Monarch Healthcare Management. Um, I was a CNA there because um, I had my CNA license so I worked at North Shore Estates on Grand Avenue um, as a CNA and then they rehired me back as the HR director. So by the way, if you have your CNA license and need a job, come hit me up or nursing eventually, I will hire you. I'm also the hiring person so just, just reach, reach out to me. I'm really hiring right now. So that's a little bit and of my she has journey. her business cards. Yeah, her. if you need my business cards, I have them. They're pretty dope. Um, they're clear. They're not your plastic. The paper ones are super, like plastic. They're awesome. So, <laughs> Thank you, Felicia. <laughs> Michael, you're up. Well, uh, let's see. I've always had my life figured out. So, oh. um, Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So I actually knew at the age of five that I wanted to come to Scholastica um, because I was a very intellectual intellectual and smart child. I wanted to come here because it looks like a castle. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so my reasoning changed eventually. Um, but I always knew I wanted to come to Scholastica. Um, I didn't always know for, for what. Um, I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized I didn't want to do that. And I wanted to be a pediatric psychologist. Well, then I realized I don't like kids. <laughs> and that would be problematic. And I don't like listening to other people's problems. <laughs> so another problem. <laughs> so that was out of the cards. And uh, so I was a psych major. Then I was a psych major with a Spanish uh, minor. Mm -hmm. Then I was a psych major with a communications double major, with a Spanish minor. Then I realized the Spanish minor might be a little bit too much. So I was just a psych major with a communication double major. Then I realized I didn't like communication. <laughs> so then I became, oh, then I became, let's see, a psych major and computer science double major, which I, I stopped then. But that wasn't before wanting to become an English major. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I've always had my life figured out. <laughs> and uh, so I got my degree. And to reform, I didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated. And so I went to do more school and pretended that it was because I wanted to be smart. And actually, it was because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I also wanted the education, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I got a certificate in cybersecurity. And, uh, um, a certificate in front end web development. I did some freelancing for local nonprofits and friends, basically anyone who would let me work on their website. And uh, back in August, I got hired here. So I came back, came back home, so to speak. Congratulations, welcome back. Thank welcome you. back to all three of you. <laughs> We're glad to have you here. So the whole idea behind the values, living our values presentation is to try to focus on them. I heard a lot of the values in everything you were saying, but I want you to get more specific now. Can you please tell us about an experience you had as a student here that exemplifies at least one of the college values behind us? It may have been a relationship that was cultivated with a member of the college community. 
an experience that helped you grow as a person, a class that challenged you, or a core extracurricular experience, or one that just simply stands out in your memory and ties to at least one of the values. And you can talk together. You don't have to just present. You can speak between each other. So, so this is a tough question. Right. Yeah. There's so, many, there's so many examples of things that would be relevant. I'm trying, trying to, to pick just one. Uh, I, can, I can start. You can start. Uh, I can start. All, you. All right, I'll start. Um, I was, when, when I went to school here, I was um, registered with the Center for Equal Access. And I, I took tests in the testing center. Um, and one of the testing proctors Back then, it was Sister Victorine Sayer, and um, Sister Victorine was one of the coolest people uh, that I would, uh, anyone could ever know. Um, if anybody in here ever knew her, she was great. But um, so every time I would have an exam or a quiz for a class, I would go into the testing center, and usually Sister Victorine would be proctoring. And she would come in, you know, you'd be nervous because you probably have like a stacks exam or something that you can prepare for properly the night before. <laughs> and oh, just me? Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and Sister Victorine would, would be in there and chat with you before your exam and um, really help ease your fears. And she would uh, say a prayer for all the students that would be in there. She, she really had an interest in, in every student that came through those doors. And um, luckily, throughout the time that I was enrolled here, um, she became a good friend of mine. And even after I graduated, um, Sister Victory and I would, would hang out. We, I, I um, go over to the monastery and, and have ice cream with her and tell her how we Snapchat. That was fun. <laughs> um, at like 90 years old, she was pretty good at Snapchat. And, uh, <laughs> I think, to me, when I think of the Benedictine values, Sister Victorine really embodied all those because she was able to take a moment that would be really stressful and really hard to deal with and, and really make, it, make you forget that moment. And so to me, she was a big part of the community, but she was also an embodiment of all the other values as well. And, in the way not only that she worked, but the way that she lived and helped other people around her um, as well. And um, I think that's, for me, a big one around here is, I said it was hard for me to choose an answer because um, the people in the community here, um, you know, everyone's, everyone's here to support one another. Mm -hmm. And the values all blend together in some way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. So when I'm thinking of one, uh, one specific story, it's really hard to do that because the way the values have shaped my education and my experience there and beyond, it's, it's, I don't think I can count the ways. Uh, I, was, I was, now that you were speaking about it, there was, um, it was freshman year and, cause these guys still have like Dignitas class, right? And it's yes. like broken up into like styles. We had, I had um, Dignitas uh, Adventure, I, I forgot what it's called, it was like an Adventure Dignitas and it was headed by Sean O, cannot pronounce his last name for the life of me, and Justin Juntanen. I'm probably butchering that too. Um, but Sean and Justin um, and it was, uh, yep, Adventure Dignitas and I was so afraid of it at times because they would have us, um, uh, climb and like do like the climb thing and then we would go out to like nature and like climb um, hills and I remember there was this one moment where we just got done climbing and I was just over it <laughs> and um, I started putting in my headphones if any professor really knows me I like just go away in my headphones sometimes and just like listen to music and I just stop being bothered with things sometimes and it was nothing wrong with me listening to music but he came up to me and he was like hey Samaj like talk to your talk to your classmates like get off your headphones like you know, like be 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 more involved, and I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm just I don't know. Um, uh, but I don't know why that stuck out to me. It just um, at, cause he, he, Sean, and Justin were two individuals that kind of got me out my comfort zone. We went camping a lot, 
Um, and it, it, was, it was really beautiful. It made me fall in love with Duluth. And um, they just, I guess those two, two people taught me that um, you cannot be reserved when you're meeting new people. You cannot be reserved when you are faced with being um, uncomfortable, because I was uncomfortable with climbing. I was afraid of heights. I didn't really want to like get up in the hills and hike. But um, continuously doing that over and over again um, made me appreciate being uncomfortable, made me appreciate the beauty in Duluth because Duluth is so beautiful. Um, yeah, that was, that was, that's, a, that's a moment that really sticks out as Sean telling me to get off my headphones and be in the moment and not be in my own little world, even if I am uncomfortable, like embrace my uncomfortability, for sure. Thank you. And then with me, with Dignitas too, I had Dignitas with Beth, she's here today, I saw her earlier. Um, it was death and dying with dignity. Um, some people might be afraid of death and for some reason for that class, it was the first cohort she ever had. And that class, it was a lot of us who were in nursing intended or medical intended, pre-PA or pre-physical therapy, whatever. And, or we just had a recent loss that we didn't plan on grieving. So a lot of us, that class was a big community. That class was where it was okay to cry in front of everyone. It was okay to grieve. Like people didn't judge you for crying. And like we, it was really depressing though, because everyone and every other Dignitas was like, oh yeah, we went on like this field trip and whatnot. We went on a walk. And then I'm like, oh yeah, we took a walk into the cemetery. And then we went to a funeral home. And then we went to the birthing center. But it was awesome. Like. I, I had, like, my favorite chapstick came from the, the Dorothy family funeral home. Pina colada chapstick, my favorite. That's one thing I remember. They have great chapstick at that funeral home. <laughs> but, I mean, I learned so much. Like, we had a lot of fun, but it was super heavy. I feel like every time after that I had that class, I needed a nap after Tuesdays and Thursdays. I needed a nap after my 140 class. It was super draining. Um, even as a TA, too, I always felt that weight, but it was a way to release and feel like a community because we had each other to support there because no one else kind of understood why we took that class or why was that even offered, <laughs> death and dying. Like, why? People always ask me, why did you take that class? I thought it was super interesting. I thought it could help me in the future. And yeah, and right now, it helps me a lot because I work in geriatrics. I, I work at a nursing home and rehabilitation center and I get to hire the people that get to take care of the elderly and have that empathy. So, community, love that. Go Dignitas, <laughs> thank you. So let's take a little break. Talk with your neighbors about something that you connected with in their personal stories as they introduced themselves. Maybe it's switching majors, maybe it's not knowing what the future holds, or something about their first year experience that they just shared, connecting to a story, making a connection with someone here, finding some place where you feel home. Take a few minutes and talk. Okay. So my next question, and it'd be great if you could interact as you go through it, that'd be fantastic. Is there something, did you want to do yours first? Okay, you do yours first and then I'll ask the question. Well, no, you, you have to ask your question for it to work. Oh, and yeah, then you're uh, going to yeah. ask your question? Yeah, okay, so you asked the question. I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're good with that. Yeah. All yeah. right, so is there anything that you regret doing? Regret doing. Or anything you regret not doing while you were an undergrad student? Is there something that you wish you had done or something you wish you hadn't done? I, I know that uh, I, put the, I put the pro in procrastination. The pro in procrastination. <laughs> yeah, I'm really good. I, I can't put it on my resume, though. It looks bad. So, um, <laughs> but I know that I was the type of person who would have an assignment due uh, Sunday, 11.59 p.m. on Blackboard, and I'd be scrolling in at like 11.51 p.m., feeling great about the paper I used to spend the last four hours writing because last minute thing. And, um, so, I, I guess my question to you all is, um, how many of you are currently putting off something that you should probably be doing? Right? Raise your hand. Oh my. If you yeah, have a okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's really bright, I can't really see, but I'm just going to go with a solid all of you. Is that cool? <laughs> all right, cool. Um, yeah, all of you. So, what I'm saying is, um, I put off things that I probably should have done 
And there, there were a variety of reasons. You know, sometimes I didn't want to write a paper. Sometimes I didn't feel like I could do something that I had to do, so I tried to avoid it. But um, and honestly, it's still something I'm bad at. I still am not good at time management. Um, as good as I would like to be, I'm, I'm better. But I'm telling you right now that uh, all of you raising your hands, I get it. But hopefully you can put them down <laughs> next time you ask that question. Because I don't know about you guys. Did, did you ever feel like you were behind or procrastinating or anything like that? Back in college, was I procrastinating? Yeah, oh my, college. all the time. Okay, cool. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, it was I mean, just you. All the it wasn't, time. No. That, wasn't, that question wasn't to help you guys. It was to help me feel better about myself. <laughs> so, so we're not here for you. We're here for me. All right? Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's one thing of many, I, many things that I could say that I wish I had done differently. And time goes by too fast. You cannot do things the way you should it's be doing and the way you want to do them. It's true. Because pretty soon you'll be old and have gray hair. Right. Or none. <laughs> <laughs> My advice for you is to use your resources as many as you can possibly can. I know I was a part of like, <laughs> I was a part of TRIO, I was a part of SSS. If I could, I would have been at McNair's. If I knew about career services, I would have had an internship that was way closer than I had to. My senior year, I took 20 credits. It was. Like, I really wanted to graduate early, so I was like, I was gung-ho doing the 20 credits. So that included driving to Moose Lake, which is an hour away down south towards the city. It's not 35. Three times a week for my HR internship, I, I, it was a great experience, but that driving, like, use career services. I know Carrie helped me try to find an internship. I did go to the career fairs. Like, start early if you want an internship. It's never too early to start. Like never too early, use your resources, go to career services, one stop. Like you are paying for your tuition and if you're not using it, you're losing it. So <laughs> if you're Back. paying for it, if you're taking student loans for it, if your parents are paying for it, your grandparents are paying for it, like someone's paying for your resources, use it. Like they're there to help you. They're there to make you succeed. And if you don't use it, that's your loss. I went to the tutor center uh, religiously. They knew me what time I was always there for accounting. I was not the best accountant. Like. You count majors out there, that's good for you. It wasn't my jam. Uh, so went to the writing center, made sure that my resume looked great. Now that I look at resumes myself, some people need a lot of help um, <laughs> sending it out there. I had one person say, um, sent me a resume yesterday, it just full-time mommy, smiley face. And I was like, is that all you're going to send me? Really? Yes. Yes. Yes to me. I, I want you to you be successful. I want you to get hired. I'm the type of person as the HR director, I want to hire you, 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 and like pay you. That's my job. I also do payroll too on the side at work. So besides, Look doing, at dis you. besides doing disciplining, disciplines, writing disciplines, I also pay people bonuses and do all that. Other Are you stuff. tired? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I'm tired. But you know, Man. I was like, this is a break in my day and also to network and also to, to possibly get possible applicants too. So I'm still working. Oh my, that was a good answer. Uh, <laughs> Anything I regret doing or not doing, man, I, uh, I, I don't want to be lame, but no. I think that I, not that I did everything right, but even the wrong things that I did, I don't want to change them. I don't want to change my mess ups. I don't want to, I can't think of a single moment in college where I'm like, uh, that was just so bad. I wish that just didn't, like, it's, I don't know. Like, it's, it's, it's really weird, whether you're spiritual or religious. It's like, it's kind of weird how these things kind of like happen the way they're supposed to. I went, studied abroad in London for three weeks with Mary, um, went to Ireland for three months. Um, so definitely, I mean, if you can, please, like she said it earlier, but please study abroad. Like, please, 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 please go somewhere. It is like, it's a whole different worldview. Um, I, I, I probably would say that um, if I am going to pick one, I'd did want to volunteer more. Um, a, a, a lot of my friends volunteered, um, did really cool things throughout the um, city. And I volunteered a couple of times, but not as much as I probably would have liked. So yeah, I, I think I would have um, definitely um, volunteered more. Duluth has a lot of really 
amazing organizations that helps a plethora of different kinds of groups and demographics, so I would probably definitely. And talk to the sisters more. There are some really intelligent, dope sisters out there. Um, all of them are dope, and um, I, w I wish I would have like ventured over, because they're welcoming, a lot of them are welcoming. Um, I wish I would have ventured over to um, their side of town and talked to them. And um, there was times where I did walk around the chapel and sisters would come up and speak to me. They're really amazing human beings, so I wish I would have um, probably spent time around the sisters a little bit more, because you can learn a lot from those, those individuals, really, really bright people, very bright people, so, yeah. Thank you. Negative experiences, did you have any? How did you power through them? Did you have any self-doubt while you were going through college that this, I'm not going to finish this, this isn't for me, I need to go, I need to find something else. How did you get through that experience? How did you, how were you successfully able to complete it? I think having a support network in college is super important that you're by yourself because I'm from Prior Lake and I was three and a half hours away from home. Like my parents weren't there, my family's not here. Like I had to make sure my group of friends were able to support me and besides friends because they had their own lives to deal with like like staff members, like I said, Chris and Sarah were my, my favorite people in the whole wide world here. I love you, Chris. <laughs> um, they're my favorite people in the world. And just having that support and being able to speak in their office and cry and just let it all out and know that it was OK and that why my, my bad week was going to be better, that I could push through it and be resilient. Because I kept getting knocked down. I got, ref like I said, I got rejection letters from companies. I got rejection letters for um, internships probably on a weekly basis on my senior year, but you know, I was gonna make it through and I made it through. So if every, someone can do it, I can do it too. I, and I can do it better, that's, that's sweet. Um, they said, like, what, how do I power through? Um, there's two things I do when any, any a situation arises that is negative. I ask myself why I started mm -hmm. and I ask myself what's the alternative. Um, and if I am okay with um, turning, not turning my back, but I'm just gonna use that, turning my back against why I started, and if I'm okay with the alternative, I just stop doing it. I don't know if that's the right advice for you <laughs> for, for college, like don't take that advice. Um, but with college, yeah, there was plenty of times I, I wanted to give up and say, man, I can't, because no one did it before me. Like, I didn't see an example. I, I didn't have any examples, so it was just like, I, there was times where if you, if you like, I fail, I almost failed like, a math course once, that, and I was like, man, I don't, I'm, I don't want that on my grade or my transcript. I'm not going to do college anymore. Um, but why I started was, to, you know, to make history of my family, to prove myself right that I could do it. Um, and then the alternative was just worse. Like, okay, so I have to, you know, stop schooling, pay back what I did because I start, to, I start to pay that back. Like, I can't just be quit and be like, all right, you'll take care of my loans, right? No. Um, and then. Um, I didn't know what I was gonna do if I didn't finish college. Like, that was so powerful. Like, I, I wanted to have a bachelor's and just be like, I did that for my family. Um, and then every time I had that thought in the back of my head of my, my, my mother and my father and their mothers and fathers before them, I was like, I can't quit. Like, I, it's, you know, and having that, you know, those, those resources, like, you're not alone. And that's like the anxious mind convincing you that you're by yourself. Like, you go to a school with thousands of students and you have hundreds of professors sp sprinkled out in different kinds of disciplines and they're, they're geniuses, like they're doctors, they're masters, they've been doing this for decades, like they're there, they're, a hall they're up down the hallway. So whenever I would get tripped up, I would just you know, call my mentor, which was Heather Bash, and like, yo, I, I'm losing it, I don't, I don't want it, like this is crazy. Um, you know, all of my, like, I, like again, like I repeated earlier, um, all of my English professors were just like my family to me. And, um, um, I was, I did, um, we had, I had therapy, you know, this, um, I had therapy through um, that one hallway, I forgot what that hallway was called. But counseling like, I, services? Yeah, counseling, I, I was all up and through counseling services, you know, like I talked to a person who, you know, was a therapist and that helped me out week to week and because, you, you know, 18 to 21 or if you're, you know, starting at 20 to 25, whatever, whatever age range you are, it's, it's challenging. And I'm, I'm sure there are many of you who are not only students here, but you probably take care of your family back at home, or you probably have, I have a disabled brother, you know, I have an elderly grandmother. When I was here, I, I, like I said, I was sending them money, making sure that they were eating, making sure that they were okay, and like having to balance my own life and understand what is this 
thing that we call school and what is applying for, for um, jobs after. So um, just, just ask yourself why. Just always, and, and don't be afraid to ask yourself why. Don't be afraid to question yourself or question things around you. But to go back to what you said, always understand that you're not by yourself. Don't let your brain trick you into thinking that you're by yourself. And um, use your resources because once you take your stress outside of yourself and um, allow someone or a group of people to just give you hands, you feel like, okay, like this is, it's, it's in my head. It's a bad day. Maybe it's a bad week. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a bad month. Like I've had a bad month, or you know, like there's been like you know, um, but it does pass. Like not to be cliche, but it, it it does pass. And that the graduating, oh my goodness, that day was so glorious. Like I couldn't stop smiling. Like it was weird. Like I just couldn't stop smiling. And um, my grandmother was there. It was very emotional. And it was like. Yes, that's exactly why I didn't quit. That's exactly, exactly, exactly why I didn't quit. I will never forget that day. Uh. That's good. Thank you. I almost feel like I don't need to say anything because you, you two uh, summed that up perfectly. But um, I think what was important to me, despite you know, whenever there was a hardship and there were quite a few in my college, in my college time. But I think the 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 biggest thing was that I would just think forward to graduation and what what could all right time could be bad now but there's gonna be more graduation's gonna come I'm gonna get a job that I love you know I think it was just always being futuristic and thinking to, to, towards the future that was really helpful to me and like like they said I'm gonna say for the third time now um, your resources are incredibly helpful you know Staff and faculty might seem super scary. <laughs> we're not, um, but but we're everyone here is here to help help you. Um, you know your success is really why everyone who's here is here. None of us want to see you fail, and uh, and I just think it's it's show strength to reach out for help. I think yeah. and. These resources are here for a reason. These people are here for a reason. And I think one of the things that really helped me was networking. Getting to become, uh, getting to uh, stay in touch with, with um, fellow students that I graduated with. I stayed in touch with faculty that I was close to. And um, one of the faculty members here um, is joining my nonprofit's board of directors. So you, you never know. Um, you never know what's going to come out of this. So it's, and it goes by so quick. It does. It goes by so quick. And you never know what can come out of this mm -hmm. unless you really put your all into it. Yeah. And then adding to that, you, as this is the HR person in me, you don't know who's going to be your reference person in your, <laughs> your personal life. So you want to get close to these staff members and, you know, facility faculty. Oh, oh my gosh, faculty members, because they're the ones who are giving you a good reference check. Because I know if I get a bad reference from a call saying that um, Jane Doe did not do a good job, blah, 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 not wouldn't hire them, I'm not going to continue to pre-screen you. And that's the truth. So you really want to get a really good reference. And someone that's dependable and that will have your back say, you know, Samaj is an awesome person, he goes to work on time, he makes it there, that's you know, right. you can depend on him, he's gonna be a great asset to your team. Like, if I had a job position, I would give it to him. Like, that's the type of person you wanna get to know and like, they're gonna be there forever. So don't put procrastination on your resume. Yes, do not put that on your resume. <laughs> even if you're a pro at it. Yes, even if you're, even if you're right. pro. Thanks. We had a question out in the audience somewhere. Go for it. Talking about some of your failures, uh, could you tell us uh, what Benedictine value helped you most with those, like overcoming or recovering from those failures? So let me rephrase just in case they didn't get it on um, Zoom. What Benedictine value specifically helped you in your failures to get through them now that you can think back and consider it? Was that a fair? Paraphrase of your question. Okay. I think for me it was for me it was pretty much all of them. Like I think they all play a, a little part, but most prominent in my life was community. 
because I really had to make um, make the connections that I made. And they, they were what made me the most successful, both in college and afterwards. Um, if, it, if it weren't for the connections I had here, I probably wouldn't have the job I have. And, and I wouldn't have been as successful as, as, it, as it was um, in college. So I would say community. Yeah, I have to agree with you. It's, it's that the community here. You can't get it anywhere else. Like, small, tight-knit community. Everyone knows everyone. I remember just, if there's someone that's not here, that's here on, on a visit, you can tell. You, you recognize faces. You might not know their names. You kind of know where they're from, kind of know where they're at. Maybe know what floor they live on or what building they, they live in, but like it's the community here. You can't get it at another college. I'm gonna be a copycat too. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I was like, um, I was gonna say love of learning too. Um, you know, um, you know, if you, when you fail, try to unless you didn't try, but um, you know, try to remember that you tried in the first place, and that the failure is not a mark of you as a person or a mark of that class, or if it's academic or outside of academia, and also community. Um, it's easier to fail when you can share your failure with someone. I know that sounds really weird, but like, you know, um, everyone fails, you know, everybody fails. So if you have a group of people, best friends, um, resources, whatever you use, that can kind of have a story to tell as well. Like, yeah, I didn't do well on that assignment either. And then like, hey, the next assignment, do you want to go to the library and like work together? I did so many group projects and I love doing group projects because you share the load of, you know, responsibility. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's, it is community and um, having, you know, I met my best friends here, you know, and I always talked to them when I was like really tripping and like just failing everything. Um, so get to know not only your resources and the professors, but get to know your fellow students, you know, these are gonna, some of these people might be your best friends later. I still have best friends that um, I went to school with here, so. Did we get at what you were looking for? Kind of, okay. yeah. More questions? Go for it. I'll paraphrase after you say it. Okay, great question. So how do you find balance while in college? You're doing your homework. You're likely working. You might be in a sport. You might be volunteering a whole bunch. How do you bring all that together into the soup and have a good soup at the end? How do you mix it and find balance? Um, you, you have to remember to be human. Um, uh, that's the one thing that I learned being here is that, uh, I don't know if this is like a controversial answer, but you, as a college student, you can't dedicate your whole energy to being a college student because that's not realistic. And that goes for any discipline of life. If you're a, a professor or a music industry person, you can't devote your whole life to it. You have to go out to the restaurant, go out to the club or whatever, go out to that party, don't underage drink at all, that's not okay. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you have to, you know, you can't, you, ha you have to, so how do you balance? You have to do benchmarks and take the time to say, okay, I'm going to do homework from 12 to two, and then from four to six, me and my best friends are gonna to go to Lake Superior and just throw rocks and laugh about whatever. Like, you have to have those moments of complete vacation and mental break from what you're doing, because if you are completely 100% focused on being a student, and just getting the work done and then you go to bed and wake up, do the same routine, you, you become kind of like bored with that style. You have to have little moments and sprinkles of mental vacation. So um, how do you balance it? You just have to like balance your time and say, I'm gonna stick to this regimen because if I don't do this at this time, it's going to jeopardize me having a break then and then you get stressed because you procrastinate it and you can't have a break now, you can't go out to that fun party be, or you could and then now you just failed your class. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to, you have to balance that way and um, eat your, I guess eat your vegetables before you eat chocolate cake. Yeah, yeah, unless you don't like chocolate. So I don't know. But yeah, try to, try to, get, the, try to get the grunt work done so that you can say okay, and even if the grunt work's not finished, you say okay, I'm gonna do 70% of this right now, and then I'm gonna go, you know, have my little mental vacation, and then I'm gonna finish the 30% later, and then it'll still be on, done on time. So try to, try to understand time. Time is the most valuable asset and energy that we have in this world. Not to be corny, but 
manage your time well. Yeah. yeah, time management is a big thing and it's where you're gonna learn the best in school. I feel like it's helped me a lot with my professional career. I know my senior year, like I was doing everything. I was a part of everything, trying to make everything happen and I developed alopecia. So I, how I handled stress, I started losing hair. I know that, I mean, it's a little personal, but just letting you know, like that's how my body handled stress. I was starting to get bald patches because I was not handling stress well. So it's taught me, like after that little health incident, it's taught me that, hey, like you need a backup. Like I need to know where my limits are. And now I'm starting a new role as, with my new current role, I recently started in October and I'm learning and I'm trying to put the extra hours in to make sure I catch up and that I'm learning the process and that I meet everyone's expectations and also meet my own expectations, but I'm also on salary. So even if I work, I'm salaried for eight hours. So if, even if I work the 10 hours, I'm still gonna have eight. So I mean like just clock in and clock out if I don't have to. Like work my hours and leave. I'll leave work where it is. And that's the same thing with school. Like, Time is like, time is of the essence. So if I needed to go lift at the gym, I was gonna lift at the gym, have that mental stress relief, and then go back hit the books. Like, you need to have that mental break and you need to have fun, because you're young once. And then when you hit the adult world, like, <laughs> it's the adult world. Like, I really wish I was back in college. I really, like, you guys are like, I can't wait to get to the adult world. I can't wait to go, like, go work five days a week. 8 to 4.30, and now I'm here at 8 to 4.30, yeah, and I was like, I wish like, I'd rather yeah. have my 8 a.m. class, 8 to 10, that's I what I want. I a 16-page paper to do. Yep, that's, like, <laughs> rather have a paper due than have to write other things, so. I think like an 8 a.m. class every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> 8 a.m. class for eight-hour days. Yes, exactly. <laughs> With a half-hour lunch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not paid for. Exactly. Um, for, for me, uh, um, it was really important for me to find out what I liked to do because I would kind of balance out the school and the responsibilities with, with what it was I was passionate about and really interested in. Um, and, and I think that really helped me take a, take a break, like you said, a, a, mental, a, kind of just a, a mental health break. And um, on, on the other side of that, what helped me stay organized because I could be working on something and be working on it all day because I'd be checking Facebook, I'd be doing basically everything else that I didn't have to do at that, at that moment, um, um, where it was just making simple checklists. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I have to get this done today, I have to get this done today. No, nothing fancy, nothing like that. Or another thing that I did was uh, pretend that the due dates are a day before they're actually due. That works most of the time. Do no. you still procrastinate? Absolutely, every day <laughs> of my life, every day. But I've gotten better at managing my procrastination a little bit. Um, but no, I think knowing what you love to do will balance out what you quote unquote have to do. Um, so I think, that, I think that's really important. So I don't know if you realize it or not, or if you were introduced to it, the Benedictine cross if you were to connect the four sides, north, south, east, and west, it creates a circle. And the Benedictine tradition is about balance. When the sisters, did, Benedictines live within the three places of work, prayer, and play. So the roots of this place and the traditions of this place are about balance in life. All of you are working really hard for whatever your goals happen to be. Some of you are pounding through your undergrad to get to grad, or you're getting done with your undergrad as quickly as you can to get out and enter the job force. But you also have to take a moment now, in this place and at this time, each day, to enjoy it. And part of that is building in some quiet time. Part of that is building in some social time. Part of that is building in your study time. So it, one doesn't overweigh the others and make you unbalanced and then create a very unhealthy situation for you. So if you spend too much time at the leisure, you're going to fail classes. If you don't take time to listen, you might be in a major you don't want. If you spend too much time on your studies, you might learn or grow to hate a subject that you used to love. You really have to be careful. Sorry, I got off on the soapbox. Does anybody else have a question? Go for it.
So all of you talked about this a little bit already, that you had to enter into the adult world after graduation. What was that like? And you're asking right during that, like that last semester? So what's that process like? What do you go through? What are you thinking? What do you have to do? Ooh. So I know we've been talking about procrastination a lot, but there's one thing that you <laughs> cannot procrastinate, and it's like that first three months out, outside of college, unless you know, you're going back home, you know, whatever. But if, like, you, you, if you can't go back home or it's like your parents are like, nah, bro, you're 21, like, you, you, you stay now. Because that was my situation. Not that they, like, kicked me out, but it was like my, my high school home was no longer, like, we, they moved, packed up a mood from that. So I didn't have a home to come back to because everybody moved. So, um, you know, as I was graduating, I was like, okay, who am I rooming with? Um, you know, what's my job, and if I'm rooming, um, I have to, you know, study. So study now about utilities, and study now about, you know, housing, and how that works if you're going that route. Um, if you have awesome parents who are like, okay, um, you can live here for two years, take it. Like, there's nothing embarrassing about living at home for, like, you know, two years, and if they're like, hey, you don't have to pay rent either, save your money. Um, so just get, it doesn't matter what plan it is, and don't be embarrassed by what the plan is, just have a plan, and you, this, that's the one moment in life you can't procrastinate, because you, yeah, it's glorious walking across that stage, but you're like, all right, I have no idea where I'm living, I have no idea where I'm working, I have no idea what I'm doing, that's like, it's not cute, it's like, oh crap, like, um, so, but the tips is um, learn how to save, um, you know, and just, you know, just have budgets for things and take care of the most important things, take care of your, your food, take care of your transportation, and then, understand, you get, just understand a lot of things. Understand where your, work, your job is like, where your job is in relation to where you live. Um, yeah, it's not much, I'm making it seem like it's much, but like you just have to, you have to have some sort of plan and be comfortable with it and know that plans change and know that your plan shouldn't be completely permanent. Like things are like, the same way you shift in college, you change majors and you change disciplines, this life is the same way. Like you, I'm at Target one day, I'm at First Avenue the next. I don't know how long we'll be at First Avenue, but maybe I'll jump to a different industry. Like, um, be comfortable. The same change that college brings you is the same the change life brings you. The college kind of prepares you for that shift of things, and it's okay to shift. Change is fun. It's, it's fun jumping from one thing to the next. Um, I would just kind of say you got to use your resources. Like I said, I don't know how much I can say use career services. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know where your jobs are, where your lines up, your internships, like internships are super important, especially in business. Like it's not what you know, it's who you know. And like I only got the job that I have right now, like I, probably because I knew the administrator and I worked there as a CNA. So a certified nursing assistant, if you guys don't know what that is. Um, and now I'm one of the administrators as the HR. So it's not, you gotta network, put yourself out there. That's all I gotta say. If they're having a place where you can meet people and I'll meet alumni, great, do it. Put yourself out there. Don't stay in your dorm room. It's not where you're gonna meet people. It's not where you're gonna be successful. You can put a bunch of applications in, but as a person, if I know you, it's easier for, to get a job. And I, I think you asked for like the, the top things that were, were helpful. I think, I think that's gonna be different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, definitely different for everyone because everyone has a different journey that they've already taken and that they plan to take in the future. So, um, but I would also say that I think one of the things that I thought, and maybe you might agree with this, maybe not. Um, I thought I had to know everything. I thought I had to know uh, exactly how to, do this and that and this and that, but I learned that I, I'm a, people call me an adult, apparently. I'm an adult, <laughs> but I never feel like, you know, an adulty adult. Like, there's an adultier adults than I am an adult. And so, I, that makes sense, right? And so I, I, I'm just gonna tell you, none of us know what we're doing. <laughs> like, none of us know what we're doing. We, we may have an idea, but, but we don't have 100% the answer. And I don't know if I ever will, or if any of us ever will. Um, we, we definitely know tips and tricks, but uh, I would just say you will learn what works for you um, as you go through college and life. And you may never know, and you might need that adultier adult, because I, I do um, all the time. And, 
But as things go on, the puzzle pieces will start falling into place. And, and you'll, you'll be able to turn into an adult or adult too. Adulting, the verb. Adulting. <laughs> it's fantastic. When we were having lunch prior to to make sure we all knew each other and could be more comfortable on the stage, you started doing the math on how long ago you were in Dignitas. Do you remember that conversation? Mm -hmm. yeah. could, could the three of you share your responses to the realization that it's been? Oh well, well, hold on. Years? Kamaj, are you okay? Are you still okay? <laughs> are, you, are you good with that realization? It's been Funny. seven years, seven since 2013. And I remember 2013. Like 2013, I remember, it was like I remember it. Like I remember everything about 2013. And now when I say it, it's like, I'm talking about the 90s, and then the 90s is now the new 80s, and I was born in 95, and I'm like... What happened, right? It's like, what happened with that time? So the time does go by fast, and even though college was stressful at times, I do miss it. I do, I do, I do miss it. Like, you were right down the hall next to your best friends. Um, every day was an adventure. Duluth is beautiful. Like, again, Duluth is so beautiful. So there's all, for me and my friends, there was always something to do. Um, and then 2013, you know, the school was just so inviting and I felt really defeated after, you know, high school. High school was very hard for me. And then, you know, I just got to this place. So I'm glad that all the other places, you know, didn't accept me because I probably wouldn't have thrived as great as I did here. Um, but yeah, the realization of seven years, it was like, man, that's insanity. That's insanity. Um, I don't know. Like it's 2020. That's I, I, I keep saying it to make sure it's not real. But like, so yeah, time does go by fast. Um, and even it's been a long time since. It's three years has gone by since I walked across the stage, and it hasn't felt like three years at all. Like, and, you know, when they when you guys invited me back up, I'm like, talk about what? Really? It's been that long? Like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it's that's it's crazy. Still, I don't know how to feel about it. I still I feel like I haven't left. It still feels like home every time I come here. I mean, I moved back to Duluth. I feel like something's attached. I can't leave. I'm going to be stuck here. <laughs> I kind of want to go back to the cities, but I don't know. It's been five years since I was in your shoes. Like, I was, we were sitting. We all had to sit there and be a part of alumni panels and, like, listen. But being able to be invited back, it's a lot of pressure. I think we were all afraid to, that we were going to screw up and say something wrong, too. Yeah, I was like, man, what do I say? Like, I hope I don't lead them down a horrible, like... Tunnel. Tunnel. Like, yeah. like, is this the last time I'll ever be welcome here? And, and I work here, so. <laughs> oh, I wonder if my boss is here. <laughs> Watch out for your review. Yeah, right? Right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Tomorrow, I don't know what you're complaining about 2013. I, uh, I started in 2012, so I beat you there. And you're still um, here. What? And you're still here. I'm still here. You're still here. I left for a little bit. Um, but no, I can't believe, I, we were talking about time before, before this journey, and I feel like time is the one thing you can never get back. Like, right. Doesn't matter what you do, you can make all the money in the world you want. You can get more money, you can't get more time. Not yet, anyway. Well, yeah, when you figure it out. Let me know. Anybody studying physics, get that one figured out, would you? Yeah. That'd be great. So we're gonna take a little break so you can talk and figure out some more questions that you might wanna ask. I'm going to prep them for the next question which all three of them said was the hardest one on my list. <laughs> Let's see if you can ease their pain a little bit by developing a couple of questions that they'd rather answer than mine. Go ahead and talk. Are there any out there? It'd be great if you would do They're begging me to ask you three times. Ask them, ask them, ask them. What questions do you have? Sweet. Ask it. Go ahead and talk. Hello? Yep. I Okay, um, I have a question about study abroad. How did you make it affordable? I'm did sorry? You, what? Can you repeat that? The last How did you make study abroad affordable? Aff affordable. Making study abroad affordable. Or did you just bite the bullet? Yeah. Um, well, um, maybe I'm wrong, but so if my first study abroad trip was 2015 when I went to Ireland for three months. And it was already cheap because it was provided by the college. I mean, I had to put money in as well, like, you know. But it was already, like, kind of unbelievably cheap to begin with. Um, so I, at that point, it was, I had to just lean on, you know, my friends and family. Um, I did a GoFundMe a bit. 
um, had my own little personal savings, and the time of application and the time of actually going abroad, you have you know some you know substantial amount of time to like figure some things out. So it's not like you apply to your abroad and you leave next week. You know, like you have you know a couple months, a couple months there. So it, it preps you for. And if you're already in your head thinking about, because I was already thinking about studying abroad before I actually applied to study abroad. So it was just always something that I was going to do. I just figuring out the perfect moment to do that. So once you like you know apply and you get accepted, and then it's like okay, it's going to cost this much. You're like okay, I have. You know, 40% of that, I got to find the other 60%. So it's, you know, basically saving and finding people who support that. And, but it's for, at least for this school, at least for that particular trip, it was already kind of like, wow, that's cheap. Um, so it was pretty much just figuring out the rest of the pieces together. And, um, and the same, I went to London for three weeks when I was graduating. And mm -hmm. same story there. It was pretty like, wow, London for three weeks. And we have all these plays we go to and all these places that we eat at and all these trips that we take. And I'm like, we went to Harry Potter Studios. And I was like, Everybody, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, at least for this awesome school, it was it was already um, it was already pretty affordable. Mm -hmm. So, and I think uh, at least when I applied, um, when I went to Morocco and China, because I think I hit over that eighteen credit credit mark. I went to um, one stop and filled out like extra like that extra. I don't know which form it is like exceeding 18 credits and then additional because I was going to study abroad, so I filled out those. And like my trips, I do not regret it. I was able to go to Morocco, rode on a camel that almost threw me off, slept in the Sahara <laughs> Desert. That was not on my bucket list, but it's super cold outside and sleeping in the Sahara Desert. I don't know if some of you have the chance to. I was not on my bucket list, but it's like sleeping outside in the middle of winter. So it's like hot during the day and oh, just yeah. cold as ice Oh yeah, night. because sand doesn't, sand doesn't retain heat. Oh man. No. That's cool. But yeah, I made the best memories, took awesome photos. I was like living my best life for three weeks. And it was nice to have those J term courses. So I, I know for management, they have the, like I said, Morocco, China, and then uh, Australia. So like they have awesome opportunities. I should have gone to Australia. And then for my master's program, they had a trip to um, Lyon, France. I was really tempted to go, but I was like, let me just write this thesis paper instead. So I could save some money, but I was like, no, nah, I should have gone. I should have. That was an experience. So if you if you can make it a make it a thing to like study abroad, if your degree allows it, if not or not, just it's so awesome. yeah, it's so it's awesome. awesome. I'd say the first step is talk to your advisor. Yeah, and your advisor can point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But that's great advice. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Laura Marland. I teach English um, as an adjunct at. Uh, uh, Scholastica, and I also teach in the Dignitas program. But I did uh, major in English, and I was just wondering if you could talk about how um, you, uh, do you feel that you use your English major in your current profession, and did you feel that you actually used your en English major as a manager at Target? Did any of the skills feed into that position? So I think this one's specific to you, Samaj. Yay. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's um, kind of why they hired me, too. Um, I was, not to brag about myself, I'm able to communicate well. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, understanding, there's a lot of things you have to, like, for, so for guest experience, my side of the department, there was a lot of, like, weird legalities and um, policies that pertain to customers and that I had to educate my team. I oversaw a team of, like, 60 plus people. Um, and whenever something was given to me, a directive from the top um, or a directive from the middle or something that we were doing, that's something that just required like words and policy chains, they were like, okay, Samaj has to be the one to like spread this across the platform. Um, and then for our customers, they had the, and I, so my demographic, so I was the ETA North St. Paul, so I lived in North St. Paul for a bit. And um, we have a they had a demographic of like the elderly, and the elderly love taking surveys for some reason. They love like telling you about their experience, about if they had a bad experience in the store or not. So I was just reading that um, and answering and replying to people's like complaints. Um, sometimes I had to get on the phone and talk to them and like go through a situation. Um, and then for um, me in the music industry, I have to write contracts. Um, contracts are big in the music industry, um, so I had to like write out these things of like, okay, arrive at this time, this is your payout, you'll have this, you know, you'll have water, and, and these things are in paper form. It's weird, like a person would want 
cut apples or you know water in their locker room, and you're like, all right, the contract says this person gets apples and water. We know it. You know, I have to write that in. So um, yes, um, I, I would say definitely, um, it's been something that has been incredibly and extremely helpful. And it's weird too when you get into the real world how many people don't like writing and reading. And it's like, what? Like, how does anything get done without people? reading this, I would ask my you know, lower managers like, hey, did you read that email or read this policy change? No, I'm like, what, what? Like, I, why didn't you not read that? Like, that's the whole point. Um, so yeah, it's really shocking how people don't like words in the real world, it's like, I don't know. But yeah, but yeah, sure, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> More questions? Are you ready? So I asked them to identify what, if they were in charge of the college, and they were to establish a sixth value, what would that value be, and what would it be about, and why would you want it? I guess I can start. So I said we should add courage because you have to put yourself out there. I mean, I know the sisters, when they came here originally, they had to put themselves out there and develop themselves. and. Being college students, putting yourself out there, you gotta put, have courage to leave home. And for us to p be able to put ourselves out here as alumni and try to be as vulnerable as possible and just show the real, real us out here and just putting yourself out there because it's not easy. It's true. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I cheated a little bit. I asked, asked a couple coworkers what, what they thought. Um, but one coworker and I talked about humor and the ability to um, laugh and have fun and the ability to maybe um, laugh at other people, laugh at ourselves, at our mistakes, because um, that's what we grow from. Um, so humor and then the other one was collaboration. Um, you're, like we've said time and time again, you're not alone in this. And collaboration is kind of a part of every value we already have. Um, and, and it's important to always work together. We all, uh, we succeed together, really. I was gonna say um, the value of rest. And like, because we were talking about earlier breaks and you know, like these are amazing. It's, it, I feel like it's hard to be a great person if the person is not balanced right. There's only, there's only so, so much respect you can give to someone if you don't have it for yourself. There's only so much hospitality you can give to someone if you don't have it for yourself. There's only so much you can do for people if you don't have it for yourself. So if I was to add a sixth value, it would be the value of just taking a step back from the world. Like community is beautiful and amazing. This is beautiful and amazing, but you know, we have ourselves to you know, go home to when the lights go off and it's just you, that's it. You know, and if you can't be the best you, you can't be the best self, it's very challenging to step into the world and try to implement any kind of change if you're just wayward and your, your balance is just off. So self-care, but rest, value of rest. Another question? We know you have questions. You're, you're just dying to ask us. Just ask. Go. Did you experience the W curve while you were here, and how did that happen, and what did you do? You've heard a lot about the W curve? I feel like I'm talking too much. Um, uh, the W curve. See, the cool thing about the W curve is that it's not a perfect W curve. It's just like a really weird roller coaster. It's like... Like there's no like real, you know, and then no, it's not that balanced. So like, um, how did, so what the question was, how do you deal with it? Yeah. You expect it. That's how you deal with it. You know that it's going to happen. Like you're going to have moments where you're just like, yo, this was a good part of my semester. I'm knocking out every class. I'm turning things on on time. And then not to be like pessimistic of the future, but you kind of have to tell yourself like, this feeling of happiness will not last for long. Like it's gonna, there's gonna be a moment where, you know, that sounds kind of messed up, but there's, there's gonna be a moment where 
I'm going to realistically deal with some stress soon. But like, if you can mentally prepare yourself for like, all right, like, you know, there's a, there's a moment coming where it might get a little bit more challenging, but then when you're in that rut, like, it's like optimistic. It's like, okay, this sucks, but man, I can't wait for spring break, or man, I can't wait for, um, you know, May, and like, I can't wait for June, and then, so you, you, you kind of prepare for each moment as you're in each moment, and understand realistically where you are, and knowing where you are in the W curve. And sometimes you don't know where you are un until you're in it, <laughs> um, but just being realistic of the of that, I would say. I, I would say to add on to that, I think, I think the fact that you know about the W curve and you talk about the W curve <laughs> is, is the first step to dealing with the W curve. The curve, acknowledge it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, the fact that you know it exists and you know that you should deal with it, it's half the battle right there. And uh, knowing yourself is really important. So getting to know who you are, how you work, how you live, and what's best for you, um, and getting into kind of a routine of, of knowing what's best for you and, and reaching out to others um, and is really going really gonna to help in that. I couldn't say it any better myself. <laughs> Both of you did, I said everything. It's just acknowledgement. Just know what's going to happen. It happens to everyone. It happens in outside of work. Like, it's not going to be the last W curve you've had. Like, I can tell you, I had my weeks at work where I thought it was like, <sighs> but you know, I just have to have, you just have to have that moment with yourself at peace, to have peace, and then go on. Because it's always going to be a brighter side to the rainbow. Like, it just, it's just, you just got to do it. It's going to happen. Yeah, and there's always going to be, there's going to be failure in your life. There's going to be tough moments. It's going to be hard, and just know that you've, you've made it through every failure in your life this far, so Definitely. You should, you'll make it through every other failure, too. That past experience, I think, is really important, being to reflect, being able to reflect on past failures or difficulties you've experienced in the past and realizing you powered through those some way or another, and having hope and implementing some type of skill or knowledge to get through the most recent one is the best way to get through it. And so reaching out to that support network, right? You've mentioned it so many times here today. You've got to reach out to the people who have your back or who will help you. There are a lot of people here who are willing to and ready and happy to do that. There's a reason we talk about the support network so much. Yeah. Because it's real. It's real. Let's have another question. I think there's one over there. Do you still get asked, where do you see yourself in five years, and if so, how has your response changed since you were a college student? Okay, the question is, where do you see yourself in five years, and how has the answer to that changed since you were in college? Ooh. Gosh, I hate that question. I always have to ask that I question at that an question. interview. <sighs> they asked me at this my interview, and I was like, I don't know where I'm going to see myself in five years, because I thought I was going to have like work and then get my MBA, but then that didn't happen because I got my MBA sooner. Um, hopefully maybe going back to school again, possibly, question mark, maybe for another MBA or another PhD, or at least continuing on my professional career with HR studies, but hopefully they travel more. That's what I wanna do. I wanna travel in the next five years. I don't know where. Any suggestions, I'll take it. I love to travel. I've, I've finally found what I like to do. I love technology, so I, I, I'm hoping that I'm gonna finish my master's in data analytics uh, in 2021, and I hope to utilize what I've learned so far in my career and my life and my master's to hopefully make an impact. In uh, five years, I honestly want to be one of the most impressive booking agents in Minnesota, if not abroad. Like, I want to go to New York, LA. I want to work with the big stars. I want to create, produce shows. And I'm just, it just slowly, slowly, just you know, itching my way to the top, trying to. But yeah, five years. Well, I'll be 29. Yeah, definitely that, definitely that. And and what's the other question? Like, how did how did that change from five years ago? Yeah, how has that changed from when you were in college? Well, in college, my goal was to graduate. Like that was the mountaintop. Like, I was even. I, was, I talked to my therapist about it. When when I had a therapist in um, at this school, it was like you know. 
I didn't see the, the mountaintop was the degree. It was like, the, you know, like I got, I, when I was walking across that stage, I was like, I, I, I could die right now. Like, this is like, this is my wedding. This is like, this is, this, like, this is it. So it took a while to figure out what my new passion in life was um, after that. But, you know, I found it. And yeah, I can't really, I'm, I'm going to be in this industry for the rest of my life now. Um, happy, very, very, very happy person, very passionate about the work I do. Um, so that's, what I, I def, that's how it's changed. I, it's just finding that new love. And that kind of happens in life, like, kind of like a W curve, honestly. Like, you kind of have to like, find yourself. And it changes. You know, what you want changes. You know, I wanted to be a famous author at one point. And then this is embarrassing. So when I was in high school, I wanted to be a professional wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be, and then um, there was just so many concussions happening with that field, but yeah. Um, I had these weird dreams, you know, man, I just had these weird dreams, but like, I think I finally found my biggest dream right now, so. Felicia, can I share what you mentioned in the whole Oh, sure, here? go right ahead. I don't know what I mentioned, but go, so, go for it. The question is pertinent, and Samaj already spoke to it, and so did Michael. Um, when you're done with college, and you start work, and you happen to do an MBA along the way, and now the MBA is done, and you've got that 8 to 4.30, you're wondering, what are you wondering? What's the question you asked? Do you remember? What's next? What's know. the rest of my life about? Yeah, yeah I <laughs> don't know what you, my rest of life is. You were busy working and being here a leader on campus, and you were busy doing classes and doing homework and getting ready for... Now that you've entered adulthood, yes, you have, and now that you've got that job and you don't have that school piece, you're trying to reinvent or discover who you are in that. Mm -hmm. And that travel, I heard travel just recently. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's part of discovery. And I can say as a 50-year-old, um, soon to be 51, I don't feel any different than they do. Up until maybe two years ago, I used to say, I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. My kids said I can't say that anymore. <laughs> I'm a grown up, but I'm still really not sure what I'm going to do. I feel like I'm, good, I'm doing really well at what I'm doing, but I don't know what the future holds. Nobody does. So I think part of life's experience and getting through your undergrad and entering the adult workforce, you've come to accept that fact that you're not really sure, but you've got some goals and you're going to work towards them, right? I took every opportunity that I could because I originally was going to stay back in the cities. Didn't imagine I was going to move back to Duluth at all. I was like, I hate the cold. I can't do it here. I can't do another winter. But guess what? I'm here. I moved back up in October, and I was like, I don't regret it. I have a great opportunity as an HR director. At my age, I jumped on it. I, at 23, I couldn't say no. Couldn't say no. It was such a great stepping stone for my professional career. If you have the opportunity, jump on and take it if you can. If, it, if it's financially OK, like I had to move up, had to pay my own place because I was living with my parents. I was going to mooch off of them as long as I could until they're like, Felicia, you need to get married and get out. <laughs> get out. Oh, well, there's an extra hook there. <laughs> <laughs> They've probably been like, you can just stay here. I would have jumped on that too. Um, but it's like, take advantage of whatever your parents are there. If you have that stability with your family, take it. There's nothing. Don't be embarrassed about moving back with your family. I would have, I would have gladly stayed with my parents. Yeah, there's there's a weird like for some reason there's like a weird embarrassment with people wanting to like not wanting to move back. I mean I don't know like I don't want to ask y'all like do you feel embarrassed if you had to move back in with, with your family after college? People are like no yeah you shouldn't like I don't know there's I, I had some friends that were like man I gotta get my own hustle I gotta get my own house and like moving back at 21 is embarrassing. I'm like, dude, you're 21. And even if you were like, if, like, if you started college like later and you're 26 when you graduate, like I'm like, I still feel young, I'm 24. I, I don't feel like an adult to adult. Like I, feel, I don't feel like I'm doing it, whatever it is. Like, um, so yeah, don't be embarrassed to get help, especially if you have a plan for the future. You had a question. So let me rephrase the question. Most of you are in programs that have required classes, right? 
either to finish in your undergrad or get into a grad school, whatever your plan is. What happens if I stumble? What happens if I don't get that requirement to get into that program that I've set my trajectory or my plan for? Did any of you experience anything like that? What happened? What'd you do? It's all about resilience. It's, it's about, it's a part of your story. It's like where you take it from there is the most important. Because I know, uh, going off of your story, Samaj, I know you've said that if you're okay with turning your back on it and you're fine with it, then you can live with the consequences, fine. But if, you, if that's really what you want to do, you're going to retake that class and do way better because you don't want that a second time on your transcript. And if that's your goal and your dream, you're going to make it. You're going to make it happen because that's what you want. And if, you're, if, you, if you think about it and if you take the class again and you're like, this isn't for me, then you just got to figure another path in life. That's not for you. It's not the best fit. Got to find something else. If, find another career, whatever that may be. But it's just a part of your story. Like you can only build off of it. She mentioned resilience. And we're all resilient in some way. Um, it's just figuring out what way that is for each of us. It's an individual story. And like, like, we, like we mentioned earlier, we're all, we've all failed at something. Yeah. We, we've all missed an opportunity that we, we wish we had. We all, we all, I'm sure, have said something like, Oh, I wish I did that better so this thing happened or that thing happened. Um, but like she said, it's, it's, it's a part of your story. So even, even if you do failings and you don't go on to that one thing that you thought was the thing for you, there will be other things. And if a thing is the thing for you, um, it will find a way back into your life and you will find a way to to figure it out. Um, I, one thing I have learned is that I don't think life has ever gone the way I expected it to. Not, not once. Nope. And uh, I'm happy where I'm at. And I think even if life doesn't go the way you want to right now, uh, the road will lead somewhere else where you're happy. Or come back and do a full circle. Uh, I was in my professor's like offices. If I felt like I was like, I, if I had to like pass a certain class in order to do a certain thing, um, I was just in their office all the time. Like, yo, I'm struggling with this. Um, what resources do you recommend that I go to to like figure out how I could potentially, you know, ace this? Um, and it was, you know, they, they 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 were just there. It's like, hey, go to the library at this time. This person will talk to you. This person is knowledgeable about this particular discipline, and they got their um, their masters or a PhD in it. They're the person to talk to. Um, I partnered with my other classmates. Like, are you feeling the exact same stress? Do you feel like you're gonna not, you know, pass this? All right, what are you doing Friday? We're doing Saturday. Let's, you know, figure this out. So, um, and, you know, it's kind of repeating, like, you know, resources, but. Also, just being like, okay, there's only so much you can do as a person. You have to know your limitations. There's only so much you can do as a person. So try to take your, your woes and your stresses to outside of yourself and figure out, okay, what outside references can I go to to um, help? And, and, and it may not work, but you try. You can only try so much. You can only do so much. And just being okay with that, like, God forbid you don't, you know, pass that course or whatever you're trying to do you did your best, and that's the only thing that you can do. And then from that jump off, from that point, you figure out your next trajectory, but you can only bring so much of your energy to any given thing, and that's the same with life in general. We have some very wise young people from my, event, my perspective on the stage today. We tried to make this about you. We gave you every opportunity to come up and ask questions. I hope you took advantage of it, or someone else asked the question that was burning on the tip of your tongue. This is the end of feast week, feast week celebrations. It's the bookend of it. Remember that we're here for you. This institution wants you to succeed. You have to do your part, and you have to reach out and ask for help when you need help from others. Would you please give our guests a warm welcome? Okay, thank you. The next step is really important. Um, I would like feedback from you. 
funnel it through your Dignitas instructor if you have suggestions to make this experience better next year. It's about you, so I'd like to make it better. Please give your Dignitas instructors feedback. Thank you. Have a great day.